the second opportunity that we are having, I want to welcome you on behalf of Minister Faulkner and the team to this very special briefing, which we have sandwiched with this very important conference which is taking place here at the Convention Center. We're streaming live, and we want to say welcome to the Oh, our colleagues in the diaspora, it's very interesting that we are saying hello to you from the diaspora conference, but not everyone could join us here in Jamaica. So we are streaming live our news conference this afternoon. My name is Lincoln Robinson, and I work in the office of the Prime Minister. I just want to introduce the other persons at the head table before handing over to Minister Faulkner. Beside me is the Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, the Honorable Anthony Hilton. Uh, next to him is Minister Faulkner, the Information Minister, Senator. Minister Fenton Ferguson, the Minister of and then to tell you the order of events this afternoon. Thank you, Lincoln. Good afternoon, everyone. We are, of course, very happy to be back in Montego Bay with our Jamaica House media briefing. Today is a special briefing because we have a number of ministers here, and Minister Ferguson has some goodies to announce, and we always like to announce goodies. We want to welcome our viewers on the PBCJ and those who are joining us on the World Wide Web as we stream live. to invite my colleague minister, the Minister of Health, the Honorable Fenton Ferguson, and he will give some remarks on the goodies that he has today, after which we will invite a representative, Mr. Howard Foster, from Toyota, Jamaica, and then we will have a signing, and then we'll come back to the rest of the briefing. So, Minister, over to you. Thank you, Min Minister Faulkner. Colleague Minister Hilton Brown, Mr. Howard Foster, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, CEO of the National Health Fund, our Chief Medical Officer. We have some chairmen of boards. We have our Principal Financial Officer, our communications manager from the ministry, members of the diaspora. I know we have the executive director of the diaspora institute and we have president of the returning residents association and critical persons from the diaspora who are with us this morning along with the media. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to share in this very important moment with us at the Ministry of Health. As Minister, I am pleased that we are finally at the stage where we'll be signing the contract for the purchase of an additional 10 ambulances for the public health sector. This is a part of ongoing efforts. This is a part of ongoing efforts to strengthen our health system to ensure that we can deal with not just routine matters, but also be in a position where we can effectively manage emergencies while delivering quality health services to the people of Jamaica. In my presentation to the diaspora yesterday, I indicated that the Ministry of Health is undertaking several initiatives to move us towards a healthcare sector that is people-centered and that can adequately serve the needs of the Jamaicans, Jamaican people, particularly at the community level. This is why we have been focusing on improving several aspects of the public health system to create the synergy that will be required for the holistic approach to health system strengthening that we must take for the post-2015 agenda. The focus on primary health care 
is a major part of what we plan to do as a component of the 10-year development plan for the health sector. We have already started with the primary care infrastructure renewal program under which 129 health centers have been refurbished at a cost of over 660 million Jamaican dollars. We have also, we'll also be looking to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our primary health care facilities and services by redesigning the way we offer care at this level. This will result in a paradigm shift which will take us, or take us into, con which should take into consideration factors including the epidemiological shift, especially where the disease burden is concerned with the preponderance of non-communicable and density, rural urban migration, and the aging population. We're also developing the secondary care infrastructure. Since 2012, we have spent over $1.5 billion on upgrading hospitals. This year, we'll be spending $460 million on improving work for 12 secondary care facilities. As a result of these and other strategies that we have been putting in place, Jamaicans have been steadily utilizing the public health sector. Last year, we saw 1,637,910 visitors in primary care centers, 707, 501 outpatient visits, and 1,380,749 hospital visits. We also dispensed 2,968,000 227 pharmacy items and conducted 5,968,227 lab tests. And we did 66,321 surgeries. We have to think strategically and holistically in order to develop the kind of health sector that will increase the productivity of our people and propel Jamaica towards development status. I do recognize that while, the plan ahead, while we plan ahead, we do have some gaps presently that we are working to address. The procurement of these ambulances, therefore, while complementing several other activities, will assist to fill some of the existing gaps where transporting patient is concerned. This will be the second set of brand new ambulances that the ministry is purchasing in the last three years. In 2013, we procured 19 ambulances, which represented a first since 2007. We are determined not to stop there. And so these 10 ambulances, which, are, which we are getting at a cost of US 71 million 71,968 dollars, or the equivalent of 81,132,384 Jamaican dollars, will augment the existing fleet, thus improving our capacity to provide emergency medical care. I am also pleased to announce that the procurement is far advanced for another six ambulances being sourced through the program for the reduction of maternal and child mortality, PROMAC. In addition, we have signed off on two new ambulances to be, to be procured through Chase Fund. Very shortly, I'm also going to be handing over two buses to be used as part of the mental health program. For years, we have had difficulty with the ability of the current ambulance fleet to serve the needs of the increasing number of patients requiring emergency and diagnostic services. It was with this in mind that we decided that we had to seriously take a look at what prevails and make the necessary adjustments. 
We had also put in place four patient transfer units that would assist with routine diagnostic transfers that were not emergencies. These additional ambulances will further assist in alleviating the previous issues faced, including a reduction in the need to outsource the service from private providers, thus saving the government millions of dollars. The capacity of the regional health authorities to move patients in a timely manner and as required will also be improved. I want to note here that while these ambulances may be stationed at specific departments and hospitals, it is our policy that they be shared within the regions for which they are assigned. So even if a hospital is assigned one ambulance, that facility has access to all the ambulances in that region and even other regions if the need arises. I want to make it clear that as a pillar upon which we base efforts to provide efficient services, the optimal use of ambulances across the sector is important to ensure quality service delivery to patients. I want to thank Toyota Jamaica for partnering with us once more to provide these vehicles. You, know, you now have the task of ensuring timely delivery. I also appeal for drivers and others who will be in charge of the use of these vehicles to take good care of them. During an emergency, you have at all times to consider your safety and the safety of patients who you are transporting. So while you make every effort to arrive at your destination quickly, you should also arrive safely. Thanks to the National Health Fund, which is providing the funding for this venture, for the continued support to improving the health of Jamaicans, all other persons who made today sign in possible. You have my gratitude. It tells me that the teamwork that we are having must be and must continue to be part of our goal. The Ministry of Health remains committed to improving the health of our people as we strive to make our country the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I kind of like this atmosphere. It's not often when I have my press briefing that I hear applause. So I think I'm, I'm going to have to have this audience at my press briefing from now on, because you're really nice. I am now going to ask Mr. Howard Foster, who is the sales and marketing manager for Toyota Jamaica, to say a few words. Mr. Foster. Uh, thank you. Um, honorable ministers, members of the press, um, audience, good, after, good afternoon. Um, Toyota Jamaica has partnered with many ministries and um, government agencies to meet their specific transportation needs in a bid to better the lives of the Jamaican um, public. We are indeed pleased to be once again partnering with the Ministry of Health to provide and to meet their transportation needs and the needs of the injured and the sick. Um, we are, of course, not only going to be providing the ambulances, but also providing the support necessary to keep these units on the road operating at their most efficient um, modes. Thank you. Um, so, um, we look forward to signing the, the contract and then to speedily and safely <laughs> get the units um, to the ministry so they can put them in use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Foster. Now we're going to have a quick signing and then we come back to the briefing. Minister. Now that we have had all of those goodies, I have to have Minister Ferguson more often if he's going to come with that kind of gift giving at the briefings. I like that. So what I'm going to do every week, for those of you who have never been at our briefings, what we normally give, we give some of the decisions that are made at the cabinet. And I am going to give you a few decisions that were made and then Minister Hilton will give you some brief remarks and then Minister Brown on the Diaspora Conference. So for the cabinet briefs, cabinet has approved amendments to the Customs Act and has instructed that drafting instructions be issued to the Chief Parliamentary Council. The proposed amendment should facilitate improved and increased collection of customs duties the efficient processing of customers' related transactions, strengthening of enforcement powers of the commissioner, compliance, and it should also further support the automated system for customs data. 
When amended, the legislation will bring Jamaica customs more in line with international best practices and standards. The amendments will also provide a framework for fast movement of goods through the ports in anticipation of a logistic-centered Jamaican economy. The comprehensive overhaul of the Customs Act has been identified as a key structural benchmark of the government's economic reform program. Cabinet has approved the issuing of instructions for a bill to make special provisions for the payment and collection of the conch levy payable under the Conch Export Levy Act. The new provisions will apply in respect of the 2015 conch season. The Act imposes a levy on conch and allows the Minister to prescribe the rate for each season. The proposed legislation will allow for the payment of the levy within three months of the submission of an application for export certificate and the export license for each consignment of conch. It will also make provisions for the levy to be paid in installments. A levy of 75 cents U.S. is being imposed for the 2015 conch season and will be imposed on each occasion and exporter applies for an export health certificate and export license for a consignment of conch. Cabinet has approved the revision of the national HIV policy. While the factors driving the disease largely remain the same, the HIV policy 2005 was developed at a time when the epidemic was generalized. Currently, epidemiology, current epidemiology data, however, indicates that pockets of concentration are among certain groups. There is also new evidence that it has become necessary to develop a policy that will guide the implementation of HIV interventions, particularly among key population groups. The HIV policy revision will provide an enhanced framework direction and guidelines for interventions to persons infected with and affected by HIV. The revision will also shape the management and coordination of the national HIV response to increase the national effort to halt and reverse the spread of HIV. Cabinet has awarded a contract for $7,234,646 United States dollars to Derrick Gibson Limited to undertake improvement work to the water supply systems serving the Kingston metropolitan area. The work includes the procurement of 50,000 solid state cold water meters and 25,000 brass valves, and that contract is for 12 months. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to go through all of them because we have so many ministers today, but I'm going to give you a couple board appointments um, so you know what we have been doing in recent times in the Cabinet. Cabinet has approved the appointment of a new board for the Betting, Gaming and Lotteries Commission. The new board will be chaired by Mr. Gary Peart. And as usual, if you need the other names of the members of the board, we will let you have those. And that board will serve from June 1, 2015 to May 30, 2018. And for those of you who do not know, the Betting, Gaming and Lotteries Commission regulates and control the operations of betting and gaming as well as the conduct of lotteries in the island. And finally, Cabinet has approved the appointment of a new board for the Heart Trust NTA for the period July 1, 2015 to June 30, 2018. And that board will be chaired by Dr. Moses Peart. And now I'm going to turn to Minister Hilton, and he will give us some brief remarks, and then we will just go straight to Minister Brown. Minister. Thank you. I'm in Montego Bay, and therefore want to say something about the Montego Bay Free Zone, um, which is a special, special place in Montego Bay that occupies um, a special place for working for investment in the city and has had an impact on the Montego Bay area in a very significant way. Last week, we about two weeks ago, two weekends ago, the weekend before last, we celebrated right here in Montego Bay um, the 30th anniversary of the Free Zone. The Free Zone has been, as I said, a special ecosystem because it has been, it started its existence in 1985 since then, it has, through astute management, 
transform itself from a manufacturing free zone into what is now the um, base and the heart of the business process outsourcing industry, which is one of the key industries in Jamaica, growing and driving job growth and earnings growth and driving GDP growth um, significantly for the country. The free zone, as it is called, um, continues to be resilient. They have last year, for the last three years, generated over um, 4, 000, no, 3,400 new jobs, um, um, been the, the, the place of occupation for over 7,000 workers in the free zone and being supportive of the, this, the industry that is now um, being generated outside of Montego Bay. So we now have the, free, the business process outsourcing um, taking root in Kingston and moving as far as Mandeville. But the zone itself uh, remain the heartbeat of the industry. The Barnett Tech Park, which is a new development, setting new standards in, in the industry, has been a spin-off, as it were, um, from, this, from the free zone, where a number of its clients were at their start in the free zone. The incubator system that is now part of the free zone has been very helpful in creating the environment and the support structure and the framework for the expansion and growth of the free zone in Jamaica. So it's a very special place. Those of you who are visiting with us from the diaspora, if you have an opportunity to tour the free zone, I would say take that opportunity. It's a very special place. There's a lot to see and to understand how Jamaica um, or where Jamaica, the business process outsourcing had its beginnings in Jamaica and is now um, headlining the growth industry and the driving growth and the growth agenda in Jamaica. Free Zone is a special place. 30 years of tremendous service, service to the city of Montego Bay and to Jamaica. And I, I would venture to say, um, having many more years ahead of it, having been transformed into a leader into business process outsourcing. Thanks, Minister. Minister Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Faulkner, colleague ministers, uh, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to advise that this is the largest diaspora <clears throat> conference that we have had since the inception of the diaspora conferences. We have in attendance 2,282 persons. <laughs> Without accounting for those who attended church on Saturday and Sunday. If we make that accounting, it is closer to 3,000 persons. So in that regard, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Richard Powell, who is seated right at the front there, if Richard could stand so that they could see him. <laughs> who is the chairman of the PrepCom. I'd also like to thank our partners, JAMPRO, the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, all the ministers who have participated, including ministers uh, Ferguson, Minister Hilton, Minister Arscott, Minister Bunting, our own minister, Minister <clears throat> Senator the Honorable A.J. Nicholson, who has been here for the entire conference and has been leading uh, this charge. I'd also want to express gratitude to the many sponsors, particularly legacy sponsors, uh, Victoria Mutual Building Society, Grace Kennedy, Jamaica um, National Building Society, as well as uh, Ray and Nephew. And to point out that in the numbers, we have had over 127 sponsors in total supporting this very important diaspora engagement uh, process. I'd like to point out that in the context of the conference, we had the Ministry of Education in collaboration with the diaspora, uh, who will be hosting summer camp initiative in July of this year 
and that initiative is being supported by the USAID and to the tune of US 250,000 Jamaican dollars where over 500 youngsters will be um, trained in literacy and numeracy. This will take place in three locations, the Cedar Grove Academy, Case, and the Sam Sharp Teachers College. I'd also like to express gratitude to the High Commissioner for Jamaica to the United Kingdom, Her Excellency Alun Asambo, who also made presentations of over 600,000 Jamaican dollars to three high schools, namely Fern Court, Merle Grove, and Covenant of Mercy, or otherwise called the Alpha Academy. And these were done in the context of the conference during the education session. I'd also like to signal that the Diaspora Education Task Force, which was set up in the post-2013 conference, uh, has facilitated the training of five teachers in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, area. These persons got full scholarships over the summer to attend the Loma Linda University, and there will be five additional teachers who will be going off to Loma Linda this summer on this very same program. And next year, the faculty of Loma Linda will come to Jamaica where they will train 100 teachers in this particular area of emphasis. <laughs> and in addition to the very good news that Minister Ferguson has brought here about the ambulances, he should be pleased to know that the Jamaican diaspora, particularly out of the United Kingdom, have donated a mobile blood unit valued at 100,000 pounds, and I would invite the members of the media to tour the unit, which is outside the um, conference center, and to also signal that they are in the process of um, commissioning another unit locally for the same tune of money. So that will assist very significantly, Minister, with the blood drive in Jamaica and to reach the various um, areas. And we also got ambulances from members of the diaspora. So you might want to give them another round of applause. From the United Kingdom uh, in particular. There were some new features of this conference. Namely, we had a session just this morning on the role of the church and faith-based organization uh, in the diaspora movement. And that was well received. We had members of the clergy locally and those from the diaspora participating in that uh, process. And also for the first time, I believe, uh, church services were actually formally incorporated into the conference setting. And we had two days of worship, as I alluded, alluded to uh, earlier. It is still early days yet in the conference, today being the penultimate day, because tomorrow, which is the last day, is the day of service. And the rapporteurs are still gathering the recommendations that are coming out of the conference, but I would like to highlight that tomorrow there will be 17 projects in six different parishes across the length and breadth of Jamaica. In the parish of St. James, there will be six projects. In St. Catherine, there will be four projects. In Hanover, there will be three projects. In St. Anne, there will be two projects. St. Thomas and St. Mary will have one project each. And this feature of the conference, I think, was introduced uh, in 2013, and it was based on recommendation of members of the diaspora, and it is to really anchor the conference in what we want to call practical aspects of diaspora engagement, so that those persons who are constantly talking about talk, it's not just about talk, it's also about action. Uh, in relation to the types of projects, five of these projects are medical mission, and clinics which will be providing a range of services, for example, heart screening, vision screening, dental screening, audios, um, audiology screening, blood pressure check, blood sugar tests, blood cholesterol tests, foot care for diabetes, and so on. In addition, 10 of the projects are education-based. They range from a healthy personal development workshop there's also a U.S. immigration consultation that will take place at the Hilton uh, Rosal Hotel tomorrow morning. And again, this is a new feature of the conference where we are having, a, for the first time, an, a symposium on immigration and deportation. 
because in our experience, the issue of immigration and deportation are matters that affect members of the diaspora, and the, the approach that we have taken this time around is to get the legal professionals uh, to address the issue from a technical perspective, because we recognize that issues of immigration and deportation are not primarily diplomatic matters, nor are they political matters, but they are more um, legal matters. And that symposium is actually going on now, and the intent is to spawn it off into a symposium of its own that may be held on an annual basis. The other projects include an organic aki farming, knowledge transfer, um, mentoring, entrepreneurial skills building, career development, leadership training, reading visits, and school supplies distribution. And one project is maintenance based, and this will see the cleanup and the repairs to a health center that is to be identified. So all in all, I'd want to say that the conference, um, by every measure that you could possibly measure it, has been an overwhelming success. And therefore, we're thankful to our partners. And I also have to mention in that Professor Neville Ying, who has been at the forefront of this diaspora movement um, from its inception, uh, giving the support for the content of this conference. And this conference is extremely content rich. And I think that persons who have participated would have benefited from the interactive sessions and from the many and varied presentations that have been made. Again, I want to uh, thank the persons who have contributed, DCAD, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade in all its departments, our legacy sponsors. Uh, I must also mention Miss Lisa Anna Gilvey. She's not presently in the room. She was here earlier. I did mention Jampro, but I have to mention Jampro again. Uh, because one of the elements of the conference is to move the investment and trade agenda forward. We also presented a report card for the outcomes, some key outcomes in 2013, and that can be distributed to the media. We also presented the National Diaspora and Development Policy, the draft version. We also presented the International Migration and Development Policy, the draft version for circulation, and if persons are interested in getting those documents, they are available in the marketplace at the PIOJ stand. And I also have to thank the PIOJ for the work they have been doing on the issue of migration and development. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Minister Brown. I know that we have many persons in the audience who are not members of the media. This is a media briefing, so we are going to ask that we give media persons priority to ask their questions. If we have time after, we will take questions from members of the audience. So we open the floor to the media. I see my friend Clinton Pickering. No questions, Clinton? I'm amazed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Mark Titus from the Kingdom. Um, Minister Brown. Um, they, in one session um, two days ago, um, the members of the diaspora from smaller pockets like the Caribbean um, described the U.S., U.K., and Canada as, a, as an all-exclusive club, um, complaining that they are not being included in some dis um, discussions and even recognized while it was defended. I would really love to hear your response on this. And the mapping initiative, sir. When it was launched um, last year, the expectations were high that um, most of the diaspora would bind to this. However, this has not been so. Only 2,000 persons have bought into it and have signed on. What is the strategy of the government going forward? Thank you. Uh, let me respond to the first question relating to <clears throat> the complaints that you have indicated from the Caribbean in particular, the Bahamas. It is a fact that the diaspora engagement tends to be biased towards the main population centers, namely Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. However, this year, a deliberate attempt was made to reach out to the other locations. And in fact, 
the very persons who are complaining are here as a result of that outreach because the Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, uh, Senator A.J. Nichols, were in Bahamas and they did take the opportunity to meet with members of the diaspora in Bahamas and to plug the conference there. I personally went to Cayman and um, there was a person from Cayman who came to the conference, but the intent really is to reach out to the other locations that have not had the level of attention uh, as the main population areas. So going forward, we intend to reach out to the Caribbean, we intend to reach out to Panama, Costa Rica, um, you know, Latin America, and so on. So we acknowledge that there's an issue where that is concerned, and we have been moving to address that issue. In relation to the mapping project, you know, I'd want to say that the mapping project has been in gestation for 10 years, that this was a recommendation that was made in about 2006, the 2006 conference. It came back in 2013, and the fact that we have the platform now for this process to take place is a success and a result in and of itself. It is not an event, it is a process. The funding that we had obtained for the uh, mapping exercise, which was 100,000 United States dollars from the International Organization for Migration, uh, was spent on building the platform, building the, the survey instruments, validating those survey instruments by traveling into the diaspora and ensuring that the instruments were instruments that were um, amenable to response. Now it is very clear that there will have to be a drive phase or a marketing phase in relation to getting more persons to populate the database. But let me point out to you that for the IOM, the benchmark for success of the migration mapping exercise is 3,500 persons. And by the time we complete this conference, we will have 3,900 persons on that database. For me personally, the fact that we have over 3 million persons in the diaspora means that we want to have a higher number of persons signing on to the platform. So immediately upon the conclusion of this conference, we will continue to work to get those numbers up. We recognize that we'll have to develop a strategy and a a message to get our Jamaican persons to sign on. And this is not strange in relation to projects such as these um, in terms of the reticence of persons in, in signing on to them because part of the concern they have is the issue of the security and the privacy of their data. So it does take some um, amount of persuasion. And what we have done in the interim is that we have identified champions who are going to go out there and con convince or persuade our people to sign on. But the fact of the matter is, we do have the database platform, it is a reality, and we'll work to populate it. Thank you, Minister Brown. Do we have any other questions from the media? Okay. Okay, okay. Clinton, we're not, we're not wringing your arm, you know. We're not wringing. I know, but how can I disappoint you? Um, I'm gonna ask a question which is somewhat outside of um, shores of Jamaica, but nonetheless would impact. Uh, there's an ongoing issue regarding um, Haiti and the dumb rep, the undocumented um, Asian in the dumb rep. And given that, you know, Jamaica has been championing the cause of, um, you know, Haiti and, and CARICOM, okay, you know, um, has the Jamaican government taken a position on that issue? And um, I'm not too sh I think I saw the question, um, you know. Caricom. Ask you, I'm going to ask you as Minister of Information to, direct the, to answer it. I, I would ask Minister Brown, but what I can say before I um, turn to Minister Brown is that um, one of the decisions that we had taken was that matter that we would have taken a CARICOM approach to that matter. So we, we are dealing with it at a CARICOM level. I don't know if Minister Brown wants to add anything. I want to add anything further to it that, that, that CARICOM has in fact um, issued a statement in relation to the matter from its genesis and it is a matter that we continue to monitor and continue to make our position known. 
If we don't, oh, I'm okay. sorry. Can you identify where you're from, please? Okay, Henry Western Mirror. Um, these short questions to Minister Ferguson. Um, could you say how soon we will see the ambulances at the corner regional hospitals? How many will be stationed there, as well as what's the current number of ambulances at this institution at this time? Oh, you want to change it? No. Okay. Just to say that for the contract signing this morning, we have not done any breakout as to where those 10 ambulances will go. Out of the 19 that came in in the first batch, Cornell Regional was the beneficiary of one of those ambulances. I am not sure what uh, they have had as their, in their old stock, but certainly in, when we do our overall analysis, we will determine based on need um, the breakout for ambulances. As I said in my remarks, there is another six that will come on the special program, the PROMAC project, and where we will be establishing eye dependency units in six newborn eye dependency units in hospitals and five for maternal. And um, out of that, will determine where those six ambulances will also go. So um, if there is any greater detail that you would require, we could give that after further investigation. And before you take your question, just to let you know that our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Marion Bullock de Cass is here, and we know that the Zika virus issue is very topical, and she is the person who can answer any questions. We brought her so that in the event that you have any burning questions on that issue. And she can probably, but we will go to you first, Clinton, and then we'll ask Dr. Ducasse to. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, Western Jamaica is very anxious to see the pediatric hospital coming out of the ground. Can you give us an update on that, sir? Is it funny, sir? In relation to child adolescent hospital, you would probably well remember that there was a delegation, Chinese delegation, that visited with us recently. I think it would have been probably about February. They came in, they did some preliminary design work, and we are now awaiting those um, drawings and there are, as we speak, discussions taking place in relation to funding. I believe that um, very soon we should have a more um, up-to-date on the Child Adolescent Hospital. But right now, um, the best we can say is that the Chinese continue to work on the preliminary design. And even before they left Jamaica, they had done a substantial amount of work. Dr. Lucas? Thank you, Minister. With regards to the Zika virus, from the Ministry of Health's perspective, it is to remind everyone that Zika virus infection or Zika fever is caused by the Zika virus which is spread by the Aedes mosquito. Here in Jamaica, of course, we only have the Aedes aegypti mosquito. 
The importance to us is that the Pan American Health Organization has advised all of the Americas of confirmed cases in one area of Brazil. Now, armed with that knowledge, we are ensuring that we take all the recommended preparedness measures very early, and one of those measures includes ensuring that we are educating our entire population. We also have to ensure that we are able to detect any possible introduction of the virus, and if and when it comes into Jamaica, that we are able to take all of the measures to treat patients as well as to minimize any further spread. With that in mind, the Ministry of Health has been leading the other sectors, including the private sector, other ministries, to ensure that the awareness is heightened, also to ensure that we focus on our integrated vector management program. This is very critical because it includes not just the work that the Ministry of Health will do, but it focuses on the work that has to be done right across the country. This mosquito, the Aedes aegypti, is the one that lives in and around homes, businesses, schools, where people live and congregate. So it means that there's a responsibility to ensure that everyone in the homes, communities, and across all business places, churches, that they are taking active part in the measures that we continue to recommend. One of the opportunities that we have to take is the fact that we know a lot about this mosquito. We know it is the same mosquito that spreads dengue. It has also spread chicken gunia recently in Jamaica. So the messages that we are saying to our population are very similar. It is to ensure that you are not creating breeding sites. And interestingly, the Ministry of Health in its surveys has found that it's the water storage containers where we're having the majority of breeding. So drums, any other container that water will collect in or settle is where the mosquito will lay the eggs, which will go on to develop. So we continue to ask persons to search in and around the homes, the vases, the saucers for the flower pots to ensure that in general they're keeping their environment clean and ensuring that there's no water settling. The ministry is very shortly embarking on a program where we want to start encouraging persons to cover water storage containers and there is a design of a mosquito net that will be placed over storage drums and you will hear more about this, but this will certainly reduce the mosquito getting into the water storage containers. In general, it means right across Jamaica, everyone has to be involved in eliminating and reducing this mosquito population. Because if someone who is infected actually comes into Jamaica, then it would mean that a mosquito would have to bite them and then become infected to continue the spread. So, Emphasis is that Jamaica has never had any cases of Zika fever. We continue to monitor what is happening in Brazil. That's the only country in the region to date where this virus has been seen to cause infection recently. And we continue to ensure that we work with our other partners. And uh, Minister Ferguson, um, we'll say a word about the approach with the other sectors. Just, just to say that, um, even before the sectors, that you would have noted for Jamaicans that we have started our public education program very early, um, both on the television and the radio. And this, I believe, is part of the real attempt to get to our citizens and make the appeal in terms of personal responsibility in dealing with um, these communicable diseases. What I have also done in discussions also with my colleague Minister for Information, we have started a discussion with other ministers 
Minister of Local Government, um, Minister of State in Transport and Works, in relation to how with the general cleaning that would normally be done just about in May, June, that we really communicate and integrate um, the programs so that even if it is not um, dengue, chick V, or Zika specific, but just that general cleaning up of drains and gullies and so on, which we did last year, which brought great benefits, benefits overall. We are also proceeding in that direction, and the National Health Fund will also be involved. And so we just want to make that known to the country, even as we appeal to you to continue to clean up where places of worship, places of work, homes, uh, just generally where people gather. We are making that special appeal. Our citizens have a big role to play. And you would have noted in the aftermath of Chick V, the survey showed that over 50% of those surveyed did not believe that mosquito had anything to do with the transmission. And so we are making a special appeal. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. And I, I have to concur with him. We, we certainly have taken a joined up approach as a government to the Zika virus, as we did with Chick V, and where we all took responsibility. And as Minister said, I can't reiterate it any stronger. The people have a responsibility. The government can't come into people's yard and clean their vases and so on. We have to make sure that around our homes are clean and that we don't offer a habitat for the mosquitoes. I, I agree with you. We actually have a pet program now where the bottles are collected and a program through the Ministry of Transport and Works and that program is in conjunction with a number of private sector companies where the bottles are collected but that's not enough. We have to make sure that all our people understand that there are areas where they can take the bottles to and for the bottles to be collected and disposed of properly. It's a new program. I understand, but it's been a new program. No, that program was actually launched last year. So I'm speaking specific to that program. But I can, I can only speak specifically to a program of the government that the government of Jamaica is involved with. Well, that is the start of a recycling program. It's a program that's going to be expanded. And I believe the fact that we have that pilot program indicates the government's commitment to recycling these bottles and ensuring we understand what these bottles do to the environment. And what we, we have companies in Jamaica who are putting their money where their mouths are and they are partnering with the government and I think we have to allow the program to grow. Rome wasn't built in a day. We want it to be done quickly but we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure across the island to do this program and to ensure that it is successful. But we agree with you, it is something that we have to fix. Um, good afternoon. My question is for either Dr. Bullock de Cass or Dr. Ferguson. There was a case of a 12-year-old girl in Dominican Republic that had um, chicken gun. Is there anything being done to monitor persons coming from that country, particularly the region where she was um, discovered in? 
Yes, last week it was a Zika, yes. possible suspected case of Zika virus. This has not been confirmed. In terms of how we monitor cases or persons who are traveling from countries of interest for health, this is a part of our routine program at our international points of entry, whether the airports or the ports. And there, with the assistance and collaboration with the immigration officers, persons who are coming from countries, whether it might be those with risk of transmission of yellow fever and other conditions, and Zika virus, of course, those persons are referred to our health desk at the international airport. We also provide health alert cards which say to travelers, if you develop any fever, any signs and symptoms, where they may contact with the health sector. So yes, that's a part of our routine program, and we have heightened it because of Zika virus in the Americas. But that particular case that you mentioned has not been confirmed as yet. All right, thank you. We'll take two more questions, and then we wrap up. Do we have any other question? Mm -hmm. Minister? Minister Ferguson wants one word in, and then sure. we'll wrap. Just one word to recognize Claudette Powell from the Northeast section of the United States, who was the beneficiary of the Governor General's award yesterday. Thank you, thank you, Minister. We want to thank our viewers on the PBC Day, those joining us on the World Wide Web, of course, our members of the Western media. We like coming to Mobe. We're going to come here a little bit more often, Clinton. And we want to thank our guests who joined us. It's not often we have a nice little support team, and we thank you. We thank you for your questions, and we want to wish you a great rest of the Diaspora Conference and a wonderful week. Thank you very much.